All right, this is AP, AB, and BC calculus. We're doing unit three, section one, which is the chain rule. So chain rule is what we use when there is a function in our function. Cool. So if there's a function inside your function, for instance, f of g of x, right, you're going to need to use the chain rule to differentiate. And most of the things that we've seen so far, I've intentionally had to avoid putting a function inside a function. Like instead of just sine of 2x, I always had to give you sine of x. Or instead of sine of 5x or cosine of 10x, I always had to give you uh, just an x inside the functions. So now we're going to talk about what's more realistic, which is that most of the time we're going to see chain rule in, uh, in problems. So when you see the chain rule, I'm going to go ahead and uh, call one function the outside function, right? Meaning literally the function that is physically outside the other function, right? So let's say, see how f is the outside function, right? So the chain rule says that you're going to do the, the derivative of the outside, meaning f prime, but you don't change what's inside the function. So f prime of g of x times the derivative of the inside function. And that's going to happen even if you have multiple layers of functions, more than just the two, right? So if there were like three layers of functions, you would do the derivative of the outside with the stuff on the inside the same, times the derivative of the middle function with the stuff inside it the same, times the derivative of the inside function. So uh, let's walk through what that looks like as an example. So in this situation, right, my outside function is sine, right? Because this is a sine, if you think about it this way, this sine has the 10x inside it. So the outside function is sine, right? So we're going to differentiate the sine, right? Differentiate sine of stuff, and you get cosine of the stuff. And then you're going to multiply that by what happens when you differentiate the inside function, right? So uh, the derivative of 10x is just a 10. So it's going to be cosine of 10x times a 10, which means that our final answer is 10 cosine 10x. If we look down here at the last, uh, at the second piece, right at the bottom of this slide, you'll see that my outside function is e to the stuff, right? So, so the first thing I do is I derive e to the stuff, and I get e to the stuff. Then I do the derivative of the inside, right? I differentiate the inside function, right, which would be the 4x. So the derivative of that 4x would be 4. So I get e to the 4x times 4, which I will write as 4e to the 4x. All right, so let's do a bunch of chain rule examples. Again, moving forward, a lot of problems that you see will have a chain rule because realistically, teachers have to work pretty hard to avoid uh, using the chain rule until you know it. So we have to construct problems very carefully uh, that don't have a chain until you know how to do it. Okay, so sine of x cubed. And again, if this is helpful uh, to notice, right, this is a sine, the x cubed is in parentheses. So my inside function is the x cubed, my outside function is the sine of that stuff. So the derivative of sine, Right, so the derivative of sine of something is the cosine of that thing, right? Times the derivative of the thing, which the inside stuff here is a, an x cubed, would be a 3x squared. So my answer is going to be a 3x squared cosine of x cubed. Now the second one is actually a, a three-layer problem because if you realize what you're actually looking at, tangent squared is the same as saying tangent of a 4x whole quantity squared, right? It's the tangent that's being squared. So there's actually three layers of functions here, right? The outermost function, right? The outermost function is stuff squared, right? And then there's a, a middle layer function, right? The tangent, right? So the middle layer is tangent of stuff, right? And then there's an inside layer where the x is, and that's the inside is just that 4x, right? So when I differentiate, and it takes a little bit of time because the computer keeps beach balling, but when I differentiate, right, first I'm going to do the derivative of the outside. Well, the outside is stuff squared, so stuff squared would be 2 stuff to the first power. So it's going to be 2 times the stuff, which was tangent 4x to the first power. You don't have to write the 1 if you don't want because it's a first power. Then I'm going to differentiate the middle function, which is tangent. Well, the derivative of tangent is secant squared of whatever the stuff is. Right, so this is the derivative of that middle function, which would be the derivative of tangent. And then lastly, I'm going to differentiate the inside function. The uh, inside function was a 4x. When you differentiate 4x, you get 4. So my final answer, if I clean it all up, is going to be an 8, because there's a 2 times a 4, uh, times a tangent of 4x, times a secant squared of 4x. And you could put those trig functions in either order. It's, it's pretty conventional to put the 8 at the front, right, to simplify the coefficient. So that's a chain rule. All right, we're going to go ahead and do a P1. Uh, so you can try it. You can pause me if you want to try it on your own. So go ahead and pause me. They are similar, right? So remember, this is secant 
of x to the fourth, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to differentiate the outside function, which is secant of stuff, right? When you derive secant, you get secant stuff tangent stuff, right? The derivative of secant is secant tangent, so of whatever the stuff is. And then I'm going to differentiate the stuff on the inside, right? So I'm going to times that by the derivative of the inside function, which would be a 4x cubed. So my final answer is probably going to look like 4x cubed secant of x to the fourth tangent of x to the fourth. All right, now if we do uh, b, the trick with b, and I'm going to give myself a little bit of space, you do need to recognize that that cubed is the outside function, right? This is cosine of 8x, and the whole quantity is cubed, right? So when I differentiate my outside function, right, so the outside function is going to be the cubed. So when I do the derivative of the stuff cubed, I'm going to get 3 stuff squared, right? Then I'm going to differentiate, sorry, I just need a different color and we're beach balling. Then I need to differentiate the middle function, which is cosine of stuff. So when I differentiate cosine of stuff, I'm going to get that it's a negative, that's a multiplication symbol, negative sine of the stuff, right? And then the last thing I need to differentiate is the stuff on the inside, which would be the 8x. So the derivative of the inside stuff, which is generally the stuff that has the x, would be an 8. When I combine my like terms, it seems like I'm going to get a negative 24 at the front, right? Because there's a 3 and a negative and an 8, right? That was multiplication, not a minus. Uh, so I get a negative 24 at the front. Uh, the cosine is squared, and the sine is not. So I get negative 24 cosine squared of 8x sine of 8x, all right? Moving on. Okay, so E2, we're going to write the uh, tangent and normal lines to the curve at the given point. So uh, we already know that, the, that in order to find the equation of a line, right, we've seen this a bunch of times, we need two things. The first thing we need is a point, and that does not involve calculus, right? My point is going to be pi over 8 comma whatever the function is, so f of pi over 8, right? Well, that's going to be a sine of, when you plug a pi over 8 in, you're going to get 4 pi over 8, which is pi over 2. So that's a sine of pi over 2 quantity squared, right? The sine is squared. That's a 1 squared. You do need to know your unit circle. Uh, you need to know that sine of pi over 2, which is right here, right? Sine of pi over 2 is a 1. So, uh, so I get the point pi over 8 comma 1. And then the second thing I need is I need to find slopes, right? And we, we've talked about that in several other videos. Uh, my tangent slope is going to be the derivative evaluated at that point, right? And my normal slope is going to be the opposite reciprocal, right? So the opposite reciprocal of whatever I got for the tangent slope. So I have to do the tangent slope work. That means I need f prime. So to find f prime, I need to recognize that this is a sine of 4x quantity squared, right? So my f prime, that's f right, not f prime. So my f prime of x is going to be 2 sine of 4x to the first, right, because I differentiated the outside function, which was stuff squared, times the derivative of sine, which would be cosine of the stuff, times the derivative of the stuff on the inside. Now, I would suggest that this is not worth cleaning up since you just want the numerical value, right? Nobody asked you for what f prime is here. You were asked for the numerical value. So this is going to be a 2 times a sine of pi over 2, times a cosine of pi over 2 times a 4, well, that's a 2 times a 1 times a 0 times a 4. It's a 0, right? So this is tricky because, so this ends up being a very tricky question because what that tells you is that the, hor so, so the tangent line has a slope of 0. That means that it's a horizontal line, right? The tangent line in A is horizontal. So essentially, it's just going to be y equals 1, right? The horizontal line that goes through the point pi over 8 comma 1. If you picture what pi over 8 comma 1 looks like, it's like 3 eighths comma 1. So it's like there, give or take, right? Um, and so that's the point. Well, the horizontal tangent line is just going to be y equals 1. And the normal line, which would be perpendicular to that, is just going to be x equals pi over 8 because it has to be vertical. Now, um, you could, in A, the other option for A is you actually could write A as y minus 1 equals 0 times, pi, uh, times x minus pi over 8 which would also give you, if you cleaned A up, you'd get this answer, but you can't really write an alternate version for B because you can't write the word undefined as a slope, right? So, um, so if your slope 
If your tangent slope is zero, then your normal slope is undefined, and you can't write the word undefined in an equation, right? So the best two answers to this are just y equals 1 for the tangent line and x equals pi over 8 for the normal line. Uh, but you could also have this answer for a, and that would not be wrong at all. But for b, you really can't write undefined uh, as your slope in an equation, right? OK, so go ahead and try uh, b, or sorry, uh, p2, right? You can pause me if you want. Uh, same idea, right? I need a point and I need a slope. So for my point, I know it's 3 pi over 8 comma blank. To find that blank, I'm going to need the cotangent of when I plug 3 pi over 8 in, I'm going to get 3 pi over 4, right? Because the 2x is going to cancel. So when I do that, right, when I plug that in, uh, it's helpful to know where 3 pi over 4 is, right? All the pi over 4s, the tangent and cotangents are either 1 or negative 1 since I'm in quadrant 2, right? Uh, in quadrant 2, what you're going to find is that uh, you have a negative x and a positive y, so, so you're going to get a negative 1, right? So, so if it helps, what you're doing actually is you're getting a negative root 2 over 2 divided by a root 2 over 2, but that comes out to a negative 1. So that's my point, right? And then the second thing I need for the equation of a line is a slope. My tangent line is going to be f prime evaluated at 3 pi over 8, right? And my normal slope is going to be the opposite reciprocal of that answer, right? So I have to find a to get to b. So uh, for my f prime of x, the derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared of whatever's inside the cotangent. But then I have to differentiate the stuff inside the cotangent, which would be a 2x, right? Now, again, it's not really worth cleaning that up because your job is just to plug in, right? So I'm going to get that this is, uh, it's up to you. I will say that it, we're not necessarily great at figuring out cosecants, most of us. It's probably easier. Uh, I don't know. It's up to you. Um, so, so it's when you do this, I would suggest that you uh, consider this to have the squared on the outside. I think that's a mentally easier way for us to picture this, right? And then you're going to look at what cosecant is. Well, remember that cosecant of theta is uh, the flipped y value, right? It's 1 over the y on the unit circle. So if you look at what the y value on the unit circle is, sorry, my bad. Um, if you look at the, just grabbing a different color for you. If you look at the y value on the unit circle, right, which is a root 2 over 2. Uh, so at this spot, right, right here, the y on the unit circle is a root 2 over 2, but that's the same as, as a, a rationalized 1 over root 2. So essentially what we're going to get here is that this is a root 2. So your f prime of 3 pi over 8 is going to be a negative in front of a root 2 squared, which is just a 2 times a 2, so you're going to get a negative 4. That means that my answer to a is y minus the y value equals negative 4 x minus the x value. And again, you could solve for y by subtracting that 1 over if you want. You certainly don't have to. Uh, I'm not going to here just because of space limitations. And my normal slope will be the opposite reciprocal, which means it'll be a positive 4, uh, 1 fourth rather. So, uh, so I took a negative 4, I flipped it and made my opposite reciprocal uh, and got a 1 fourth. Okay? All right, let's keep going. Uh, so in E3, we have h of x equals f of g of x. So that's a chain rule, right? And we're asked to use this table to find values uh, for h prime. So first thing we should do is figure out what the equation for h prime would be, right? So since it's a chain rule, that's going to be f prime of g of x times g prime of x, right? That's the formula that we're going to have to use for all of these. So that means that h prime of 1 is f prime of g of 1 times g prime of 1. And those are all values I should be able to find on the table. So let's look at g prime of 1. That's a negative 2. And g of 1 is a 5. So this should be f prime of 5 times a negative 2. And then I look and say, OK, well, what's f prime of 5? Oh, that's a 2. So this should be a 2 times a negative 2. My answer is a negative 4. Right? If we do the other one, sorry, I was trying to switch colors, but sometimes it's a little bit slow. There we go, beach ball. OK. So if we try and do, oh, my bad, take that back. So many slides. OK, so if we take uh, h prime of 5, my bad. All right, so h prime of 5 should be, the computer is definitely struggling to write at my speed, um, should be f prime of g of 5 times g prime of 5. So now we're going to look for those numbers. So g prime of 5 is a negative 8. 
g of 5 is a 1. So that's going to end up being f prime of 1, because that's what g of 5 was, times a negative 8. Well, f prime of 1 is a negative 4. So that's going to be a negative 4 times a negative 8, which is going to give us a 32. Right? And then the last part of this question is write the tangent line at 1. Uh, so tangent line to h, well, that means I need two things. I need the point h of, so I need the point, right, which is going to involve h of 1. Well, I can find h of 1 by doing f of g of 1, right? Um, so g of 1 is a 5, right? So that's going to be f of 5, and f of 5 is a 1. So uh, we're going to get uh, a 1. Right, so f of 5 is a 1. So we now have a point. We know that the point is 1 comma 1, right? The second thing I need is a slope. Well, my slope is going to be h prime of 1, which we found in part a to be a negative 4, right? That's a negative 4 from part a of this problem. So now I have a point and a slope. My answer is going to be y minus the y value equals my m x minus the x value. Again, you're welcome to add the plus 1 over to solve for y if you want. All right, uh, for P3, so for P3, we're going to have the same basic problem, right? So you're going to find your H prime of X is F prime of G of X times G prime of X. And then we're going to do the same thing, right? So my H prime of 0 should be F prime of G of 0 times G prime of 0, right? And then we use the table. So g prime of 0 is a negative 2, g of 0 is a 3, so that's going to be f prime of 3 times a negative 2, f prime of 3 is a 2, so I'm going to get 2 times negative 2, which is going to give me a negative 4, right? Uh, h prime of 3 is going to be f prime of g of 3 times g prime of 3, right? And so if we, uh, I'll do that in a different color just to make it so that I can circle something different in the table, so we'll do that in red. So g of uh, g prime of 3 and g of 3, that's going to end up being f prime of 0 times this negative 8, right? f prime of 0 is a negative 4, so I'm going to get negative 4 times negative 8, which is going to give me a 32. Cool. Um, last problem is write the equation of the tangent line at x equals 3. Well, that means I need two things, right? I need the point 3 comma h of 3, so I need to find h of 3. Well, h of 3 is going to be uh, f of g of 3, right? Which is going to be, if we look at g of 3, it's 0, so that's f of 0, which is going to be a 5, right? f of 0 is a 5. So I now have the point, and then in part b, I found the slope Right, so I know h prime of 3 already is a 32, right? So y minus the y value equals my m x minus the x, uh, sorry, x minus the x value, and there we have it, okay? And that x value is a 3. All right, cool, moving on. So uh, for what values of f of x, or of x does the function have a horizontal tangent? So, so this is a pretty common AP question, and we're going to have to be able to translate what they're asking. So what they're actually asking is, when does f prime of x, which is the tangent slope, equal 0, right? That's the question. So in order to do that, I have to, one, so the first thing I have to do is translate that that's what they're asking, right? Second thing I have to do is I need to find f prime, right? And then I need to set f prime equal to 0, and I need to solve, right? So the trick is that if you don't recognize that that's what this is asking, if you can't translate this question into what this is asking, then you're not going to be able to do the problem, right? So I notice that this is a product rule, because x squared times e to the 3x is a product no matter what I do. So I'm going to get u. dv is going to be a chain, right? This is, this is a chain inside a product, right? So dv, this is my u, here's my dv, it's going to be the derivative of e to the 3x, times the derivative of that inside, which will be a 3, plus v, which is e to the 3x, and du is going to be a 2x, right? So this is v du. So if I clean that up, I get 3x squared e to the 3x plus 2x e to the 3x. And I want to know when that equals 0, right? And, and knowing this, knowing that this is what they're asking and setting it equal to 0 is going to be worth points on an AP. So I see that there's a GCF of an x e to the 3x, and what's left after I take that out is 3x plus 2. So either x is 0, that's one of my answers. Oh, my bad. Keep doing that. Sorry, folks. Either x is 0, or e to the 3x is 0, which is a lie, 
because e to the 3x is positive. So this is not a thing. Or 3x plus 2 equals 0, which is going to give me x is negative 2 thirds. So my two answers are x is 0 and x is negative 2 thirds. All right. For what values uh, of x is the function of a horizontal tangent line? Same basic idea. We have a product rule, and in my product rule, there's going to be a chain, right? I need to communicate that I need to know when f prime of x equals 0. That's important communication that you want to have. So f prime of x is u. dv is going to be derivative e to the stuff is e to the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. So that's my dv plus v. du is going to be a 3. So I'm going to get that f prime of x is a 12x e to the 4x plus a 3 e to the 4x. I want when that equals 0. So I'm going to take out a GCF of a 3 e to the 4x, and I seem to be left with a 4x plus 1. So either 3 e to the 4x is 0, but that's a lie because uh, this right here is positive, so that's not it. Or 4x plus 1 is 0, so x equals negative 1 fourth, and that's my only answer here. All right, uh, let's go ahead and do E5, right? Uh, we're going to do a chain, uh, a quotient inside a chain. Okay, so for example 5, we're going to differentiate a, a quotient that is inside a chain, right? So, uh, so the issue here is that we already have... Sorry, we're beach balling a little bit. All right, so the issue here is that inside, inside here, we have a quotient, right? So we're going to have a high function and a low function, right? High function is going to be the x squared plus 3. The low function is going to be the 4x minus 5. But the entire thing is inside a cube, right? So when we differentiate, right, my f prime of x, is going to differentiate the outside thing, which is stuff cubed first. So the, de the derivative of stuff cubed is 3 stuff squared, right? And then I don't change the stuff at all. So that's going to stay as an x squared plus 3 on top of a 4x minus 5, right? So that's, that's the derivative of stuff cubed, right? And then I'm going to multiply that. Sorry, we're still beach balling when I switch colors. So I'm going to multiply that by the derivative of the stuff on the inside, which is that quotient, right, that high over low. So when I do that, I'm going to get low. Notice that it's a binomial, so I want it in parentheses. d high is going to be a 2x minus high, which is the x squared plus 3. Again, that's a binomial, so I need it in parentheses. d low, which would just be a 4. Draw the line, and I'm going to square the low, which will stay as a 4x minus 5 quantity squared. There's no reason to change that. So now really the only thing left to do is clean up the numerator um, of this, right? So, so I really need to clean up this whole thing by distributing. So I'm just going to write, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do the work to do that right above here. Uh, I'm switching colors so it's a little bit less confusing. So uh, I'm going to distribute this 2x and I'm going to get an 8x squared minus a 10x. And then I'm going to distribute this negative 4, right? It, it's, it's a negative in front and also a 4. So it's a negative 4x squared minus 12, right? And that's nice enough that I can combine my like terms. And so what's going to happen is that my f prime of x is going to be a 3. Uh, and you can leave it like this. I'll show you another option in a sec. But I can leave it with this original thing uh, squared, right? And then inside here, I'm still going to have a 4x minus 5 squared on the bottom. But on the top, it seems that I'm going to have an 8x squared minus a 4x squared, which would be a 4x squared, right? Uh, a minus 10x and a minus 12, right? all over this 4x minus 5 quantity squared. Uh, and that answer's fine. There's definitely nothing wrong with that. It's, it's OK. There are a couple other things I could factor out if I wanted. I could take out a GCF of 2 from this trinomial that's on top if I want. It doesn't necessarily help me much. Uh, and I could try and figure out if what's left factors. I don't really think it's worth it. The other way you might see this is you might see it as one giant fraction, where the x squared plus 3 quantity squared is here, uh, the 4x squared minus 10x minus 12 is here. And then on the bottom, you're actually going to end up with four of these, right? Because uh, you had a 4x minus 5 quantity squared right here, because this was squared, and then another one squared. Sorry, I said four, and I wrote two. My bad. Uh, give the eraser a sec. Oh, that's the giant eraser. Well, that's OK. We'll fix it. So, so this is 4x minus 5 quantity to the fourth. I said four of them, and I wrote two of them. My bad. So you might see it that way. The only other thing that I could see that you might 
uh, have happen as factor out of two GCF from this trinomial, in which case I guess if this were multiple choice, you might see the answer with the two out in front with the three, uh, and that would give you an x squared plus three quantity squared times a two x uh, squared minus five x minus six, which may or may not factor, but I'll be honest, it's not really worth my time to see if it factors. Um, if I were asked to find information about this function, I would try and factor that trinomial. Um, honestly, I probably would have stopped here and tried to match my multiple choice answer if it's multiple choice, right? So I probably would have stopped there and I'm only simplifying it selfishly for other reasons if I need to. All right, let's go ahead and do a P5 and then that'll be it for this section. Pick, uh, P5, differentiate. Now notice the trick here is that it's a product rule, but there are three, right? So recall that the product rule only deals with two functions. So the issue that you're gonna have is that you're gonna have to group two of these together as your U and call one of them your V. And then within U, so within that U, it's another product. Now, it didn't matter which ones I put together, right? So I'm trying to squeeze the words another product in there. It doesn't matter which ones I put together. I chose to make these two U and this one V. You also could have done it where the X to the fourth is your U and the, the two other functions together are a product in their V. The reason I chose the way I did is because I think um, x to the fourth is by far the easiest of these three functions. So I, I leaned on the idea of using the easiest one and just pairing it with somebody. It didn't make a lot of sense to put it by itself. So uh, so let's, when when we do du, right? So that, that's the big trick to this problem. Du is a product, right? When you do u dv plus v du, du is gonna be its own product. So my f prime of x is gonna be u, which I just copy exactly as it is, x to the fourth e to the two x dv, which is a chain rule, right? Because there's a three x inside the sine. So the derivative of sine is cosine of the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. So there's my u and my dv. Easy peasy, not a big deal. My v isn't gonna be a big deal. That's gonna be sine of three x, not a big deal. But then du, du is gonna be the one that's tricky, right? Because since u was an x squared, uh, sorry, x to the fourth, my bad. And I learned my lesson and I will change it to the smaller eraser. All right, so. Uh, since my du is an x to the fourth times an e to the two x, this is going to have its own little u, u and v on the inside. So my du, right, when I put it in here, is going to be this u dv, which will be e to the stuff times the derivative of the stuff, plus v du. So this entire thing is what's gonna have to get put in here next to the sign. So I'm gonna get, uh, essentially, and if you wanna clean it up, you could, right? I'm gonna end up getting uh, a two x to the fourth e to the two x plus a four x cubed e to the two x. Sorry, I ran out of space a little. That's a two x, not two, two to the x, right? So that's a that's a two x, it just kinda got a little messed up. So you can clean this up if you want. There's not much that you can do to make this look nicer, to be perfectly honest. If you try to clean this up, you're gonna have a three x to the fourth e to the two x cosine of three x, that's this whole term. And then when you distribute the sine of three x, you're gonna get a plus two x to the fourth e to the two x sine of three x. And when you distribute to here, you're gonna get a plus four x to the third e to the two x uh, sine of three x. So it, even if you wanted to make this nicer, right? So this is fine. This answer is absolutely correct and it's a little bit complicated, but it would have worked that way no matter which two functions you paired together in the original. The big trick is that if you have a three way product, three things being multiplied, you have to basically do a product within a product. Now, this answer is great and I would probably stop here. If for any reason you were asked to factor it, there is a pretty big GCF. There's an x cubed and an e to the 2x um, and not much else. So you could pull out an x cubed and an e to the 2x. And if you did that, what would be left would be a 3x cosine of 3x uh, plus a 2x sine of 3x plus a 4 sine of 3x. And again, you can't do anything with that. You're not going to be able to simplify it, but that would also be okay. So that is it for section one of unit three.